All right, so we have these two ways of measuring circulation around a closed curve. We can just do the line integral around the closed curve, or we could do the, we think we could do the double integral of the curl of the vector field in the region enclosed by the curve. And based on a discrete example, we think that these might actually be equal, although of course the discrete example doesn't really tell us um, in a continuous context whether these are equal or not. Um, but we did work out a continuous example, and these did turn out to be equal in that example, which is a bit surprising. Um, so our goal now is to actually prove whether these two things are equal or not. Um, one drawback of the way that we have it written right now is that there's no indication that C is actually the boundary uh, curve for the region R. And so what we will do is introduce some notation for the boundary of R. And the notation that we're going to use is, uh, it looks like this, and it looks like this clump of symbols should be pronounced partial R, but it's not. It, this is pronounced boundary of R. Um, so instead of writing C here, we'll write boundary of R. And a, a second bit of notation is that uh, this, this curve, we know that it's closed. That is to say, it is a loop. It starts and ends at the same place. It doesn't have endpoints dangling out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it's closed because it's the boundary of, of a region. And uh, also, we're going to be going around this in a very particular direction. We will be going around this curve counterclockwise so that the so that the region R is on the left, right? So if we have a region and our boundary curve. We're going counterclockwise so that as we go around the curve, the region is always to our left. Um, to to indicate these two things that we're doing a line integral over a closed curve and we're going counterclockwise so that the interior is on the left, we will add a little decoration to our integral. We'll put a little ring around it like this. This doesn't change how we will calculate this integral, but it's just notation to um, emphasize the fact that we have a closed curve and we're going counterclockwise. Okay, so what we are going to prove, try to prove is that the integral around the boundary of R of f dot dr is equal to the double integral of curl over the interior. Now it's hard to know how to start because this is such a general claim. So what we're going to do is start by only uh, proving this for very specially shaped regions. And what we're going to do is, uh, part, a part of the art of figuring out a proof for this is figuring out what, what shapes for regions will help us make progress. Um, and uh, what we'll do, at least to start with, is to look at regions shaped like this. Um, the left and the right hand sides will be just straight vertical line segments, but the top and the bottoms will be graphs. So this top graph, let's call that uh, g of x, and this bottom graph, let's call that f of x. And I guess we, we need these to be smooth so that they have derivatives. Otherwise, this line integral doesn't even make sense. I guess piecewise smooth, right? Piecewise smooth. All right. If there are any corners, we'll just split things up. We'll, we'll see later how we can deal with the fact that we might have split things up. OK, uh, the vector field, let's call m comma n. OK, and uh, it's, it's slightly tricky to know, um, slightly tricky to know, you know, what approach we should take for seeing if these should be equal. Um, and the approach that we're going to take is, is actually uh, a little funny. What we're going to do is this line integral, remember another way to express this line integral is that this is m dot, uh, n, m dx plus n dy, right? Um, remember this is dx is a shorthand for x prime dt and dy is a shorthand for y prime dt. So this integrand here really is just this dot product. Um, so what we're going to do, and of course the curl of f is the double integral over the region of, you know, curl of f is partial 
n partial x minus partial m partial y, right, dA. And what we're actually going to show is that this first part, the m dx part of this integral, is equal to the integral of the minus partial m partial y portion of the flux integral. Okay. I'll leave it as an exercise that the n dy portion of the line integral is equal to the partial n partial x version of the double integral. Um, uh, so let's concentrate on the m dx part. So we have these two things that I'm claiming should be equal to, or these two integrals that I'm claiming should be equal to each other. And still that doesn't tell you, or that doesn't give us much of a hint of how we should try to prove that these are equal. And we're going to prove it in like the least clever way possible. We're just going to write down both of these integrals and then observe that they give us the same thing. Uh, so for the line integral, Unfortunately, right, remember we have to go counterclockwise around this boundary for this line integral. And unfortunately, this line in integral has four parts, right, four different curves, which I'll call C1, C2, C3, C4. And we have to just write down these four line integrals. So a bit of a pain. So let's go around C1. We need to parameterize that curve. But that is, it's a graph, the graph of the function f. So we can just use t comma f of t as our parameterization as long as we remember that the t values are starting at a and going to b, our prime is going to be 1 comma f prime of t. Okay, so then our integral is the integral from a to b of uh, m. Uh, now we do, we do have to be explicit about um, what we're plugging into m. We can't just write r because we're going to have several different line integrals with different parametric curves. So if we used r for each one of them, that would get confusing. So we have to explicitly say it's m of t, t comma f of t. Okay. Oh, and right, we are uh, we are evaluating only the line integral of m dx. So here's m, and then dx, remember, is x prime dt. So that's uh, 1 times dt, so just dt. Okay, so there's the first part of our line integral. For the second part of our line integral, going up the right-hand side of this region, right? well, this is a straight line segment. So uh, along this line segment, the x-coordinate is always b. The y-coordinate is varying, so we can take it to just be t, as long as we remember that t is starting at the bottom corner. Right? The lowest height along this line segment is down here, and that's uh, f of b. And then the largest height is g of b. OK, so there are our bounds. Um, r prime is uh, looks like it's going to be 0 comma 1 and so when we write down our line integral from f of b to g of b of m times x prime well x prime is 0 so this actually contributes 0 so we don't get anything from m uh, or anything from this line integral okay now c3 that portion of the graph across the top is also, or that portion of the curve across the top is also a graph. So again, we can use the graph parameterization, t comma g of t. As long as we remember the t values go from the right to the left. So we have to go from b to a this time. Okay, and then r prime is uh, 1 comma g prime of t. And then the integral is from b to a, remember, from b to a, uh, times m of t comma g of t times x prime, which is 1 dt. OK. Um, 
It's a little awkward to have these in the A and B in this order, but we can switch this order if we also throw in a minus sign. So minus integral from A to B of M of T comma G of T dt. Okay, and now for the fourth line integral. Again, this one is a line segment. The x-coordinate is a, and the y-coordinate is changing, so we can take that to be t, as long as we remember the t-values. The upper left corner is at height g of a, and the lower, sorry, upper left corner is at g of a, and the lower left corner is at height f of a. Okay, so this is going to give us, oh, and r prime is 0 comma t, sorry, 0 comma 1. And this time again, uh, when we do m times x prime, x prime is 0 dt. So this is going to give us 0. All right, so the total is the integral from a to b of, so the first part, it was the integral from a to b of t comma f of t dt. And for the, sec for the third part, right, the second part and the fourth parts were 0. Uh, but the third part was the integral from, sorry, minus the integral of from a to b of m of t comma g of t dt. OK. And we can actually collapse these together by saying the integral from a to b of m of t comma f of t minus m of t comma g of t. OK, so this is the line integral uh, dt. OK, so this was the line integral of line integral around the boundary of m dx. OK, so the other part that we were going to compare this to is the line integral over the region, or the integral over the region of minus partial m partial y. So now let's evaluate that. So we need the integral over the region of partial, uh, sorry, minus the integral over the region of partial m partial y dA. OK, now for this region, remember the region is shaped like this. Uh, for this region, the bounds are actually pretty straightforward to write down if we do them in the correct order. So if we put dx on the outside and dy on the inside, then the x bounds are from A to B. And for a single vertical cross section at a single x value, we're going from the graph of f up to the graph of g. So this is f from f of x to g of x. Okay, And we're integrating partial m partial y. OK, well, you can see that we've, we have things set up so that um, the partial derivative here and this antiderivative will undo each other. So we get partial a uh, minus the integral from a to b of, right, for our antiderivative to do this inside integral, we just remove the partial derivative, m. Uh, but then we have to go from y equals uh, f of x to uh, y equals g of x. Right. Remember, this partial derivative is a function of y and x. So x, y like that, and x, y here. And then when we plug in our bounds, we get minus the integral from a to b of m of x comma uh, g of x minus m of x comma f of x dx. OK. 
Okay, and now, well, now we could use up this minus sign on the outside by just turning this subtraction around. So integral from a to b of m of x comma f of x minus m of x comma g of x. Okay, so there's our double integral. And remember, we were going to compare this to the line integral, which is up here just off screen. <laughs> okay. If you compare this with this, the only difference is, well, there isn't a difference. The only difference is that the integral involved uh, has a t up here and an x down there, but because we're integrating across that variable, it doesn't matter what the variable is called. So these two, these two integrals are actually exactly the same. So we've succeeded in proving that the line integral around partial r, our boundary of r of m dx is equal to the double integral over the region itself of minus partial m partial y, uh, dA, okay, for these specially shaped regions. Okay, so um, you can imagine that uh, proving the corresponding thing for the other portion is going to be look very similar. I'll leave it as an exercise. I won't do the giant calculation, but using exactly the same tricks, you can, use, you can prove that um, the line integral around the boundary of R of n dy is equal to the double integral over the region of partial n partial x dA for regions that, well, the regions look different, right? Because they, they have, will have to have graphs on the right and the left instead of on the top and the bottom, like this, OK? But what this does is uh, this pr these two facts together Right. If we can choose regions so that both of these are true, then we can add these together. So let's add these together. If we add these together, we get the line integral around the boundary of R of m dx plus n dy equals the double integral over the region of partial n partial x minus partial m partial y dA. So this is what we wanted to prove, right? This is the line integral around the boundary of R of f dot dr. And on the right-hand side, this is the double integral over the region of the curl of f dA. But both of these things will be true for regions that, look, that have graphs on the top and the bottom and, also, and left, straight left and right sides, and also graph regions who, that have a flat top and the bottom and graphs on their left and right sides. Um, and it seems like there aren't any regions for which this is true. But actually, there are many regions that satisfy both of these. They're regions that are flat on two sides and have a third side that is a graph, like this. Actually, the third side has to be a graph, uh, y as a graph of x, and x as a graph of y. So regions like this. But if you have some complicated region, you can always split it up into tiny pieces that look like this, right? That's the key thing. So now we, so we've proved that our, our relationship holds for these very simple kind of regions. Now we need to ask, well, how do you put these pieces back together, okay? So what we're going to think about next is Right. If we have these very simple, if we have these very special pieces where we know this region is true, um, what happens when we start putting these special regions together? Okay. So next, we're going to prove that this relationship holds for so-called simple regions. Simple just means a, a region whose boundary is a simple curve, which is a piecewise smooth loop that is connected. So just a, the boundary is just a single loop like this. Okay. The idea is just, well, we can, if by subdividing this into possibly very small pieces, right, if we cut this into pieces small enough, all of these regions will be of the special type 
that uh, where we have where we know that this equation is true right for all of these regions the top and the bottom are either straight or graphs and the left and the right are either straight or graphs um, and uh, for the one curved side that we're allowed it is uh, x is a function of y and y is a function of x so you can you can see that if you're if you're if the boundary is smooth you can chop it into extremely tiny pieces for which uh, this is for which we have these special properties um, so on each of these tiny pieces this uh, this relationship is true and the question is what happens when you add these all together so um, so let's see on this region we have a bunch of curves right uh, C1, C2, C3, and so on, but also curves interior to the, in fact, let me draw this picture bigger. Um, we also have curves that are interior to the, uh, okay, actually we need like this. Okay, so we have curves that uh, this line integral, um, Computes. Actually, let's start with the double integral. So the double integral integrates curl over this whole region, right? Um, well, on just this one part, this upper right-hand part, we know that the integral of the curl around this part is equal to the line integral around this region, right? So the integral. Let me write it this way: the integral around the the whole region of curl f d a. That's the sum, so I'll write sigma for sum, for all of the subregions of the integral of the curl of f dA over each subregion. And we have lots of subregions, so let me use an index. So we're going to sum, we have some finite number of subregions, right? So here's region 1, region 2, region 3, and so on, up to region n. Uh, the double integral of the curl over the entire region is just the sum over the individual regions. Right? That's just a basic fact about double integrals. But on each of these individual regions, so we have sum from i equals 1 to n, on each of these individual regions, we know that this equation holds because each of the individual regions is of this special kind. So. Uh, for each of these individual double integrals, we can replace it with the integral around the boundary of each of those regions of f dot dr. Because each of these regions, each of these boundaries is piecewise smooth, right? It has some corners, but each piece, individual piece, is a smooth curve. Okay, so what happens when we add up all of these line integrals? Well, exactly like in our discrete case, right, when we do each of these line integrals, for the portion of the line integrals along these interior boundaries, the line integral shows up once as positive and once as negative because we're traversing it when the two times we traverse this interior boundary curve, we do it in opposite directions. So all of the interior boundary curves will cancel and we just get the sum over the exterior boundary curves. the exterior boundaries of uh, the line integral of FDR. Okay, so I don't know what to call this. Let me say CI for this exterior boundaries. But all of these exterior boundary curves put together are exactly the uh, entire boundary. So when you add all the, the line integral up for all of the exterior boundary curves, you get just the whole boundary curve. So that's the line integral around the boundary of R of f dot dr. Okay, so now we know that this equation, the integral of the curl over the interior is equal to the line integral of uh, f around the exterior, or around the boundary curve. So now we know that that's true for these simple regions where the boundary of the region is just one single simple closed loop, right? A closed loop that doesn't intersect itself. So now finally we can um, prove this relationship for arbitrary regions. So the thing about arbitrary regions is that 
they might have holes inside, right, like this. But if there are holes inside, we can just add curves like this, right? This is going to split up the exterior boundary, so C1 and C2, right, like this. This boundary for the inside part, right, the region that we're integrating over is this thing. These, the stuff inside of these holes is not included in the region. So um, to, in, to integrate around these parts, we have to go uh, clockwise to keep the region on our left, right, like this. And then this one too, we have to go clockwise to keep the region on our left. Okay, so if we, so we have this, these other interior boundary parts, C3 and C4. Well, if we insert these, these cuts, we'll call these C5 and C6. If we insert these cuts, well now the integral around the entire boundary is uh, of f dot dr is going to be, let's see, so it's the integral across C1 plus, right, so let me draw the path that we're going around. So it's the integral around C1, that's this part, plus the integral across C5, and then we have to go around this part, so the integral over C3, but then we go across C5, but in the opposite direction. So we can write minus the integral over C5, and then plus the integral over C2. That's this part. And then plus the integral, oh, I have C5 twice. Better call this one C6. So plus the integral over C6, and then plus the integral over integral over C4, that's this part, and then to get back to our starting point we have to traverse C5 again, sorry C6, but backwards, so we're going to get minus the integral over C6. So you can see the um, integrals coming from the these extra cuts that we make, since we traverse those cuts twice in opposite directions, those cancel, much like in the discrete case. Um, so we're left with the integral over C1 plus C3 plus C2 plus C4, but that's the boundary of R, right? So the idea is inserting these cuts and traversing them twice, uh, those, don't, uh, those don't change the value of the line integral. But what they do is they make the interior uh, now simple. Right? <laughs> because it's just a single loop rather than these disconnected loops. Right? Originally we had these three different loops, but we've connected them by adding these cuts. Right? But adding the cuts doesn't change the line integral. So that means that our relationship that we are trying to prove this whole time, it is true for any region with piecewise smooth boundary. All right, so finally we did it. It took a ton of work. We had to start with these very special regions to make the integrals possible to do. And then once we, once we know this fact is true for these very special regions, then we can start pasting these regions together in large, into bigger and bigger pieces. And along these lines where we're pasting things together, the contributions of the line integrals cancel, and so we keep getting just a line integral around the boundary. So this fact is called Green's theorem after the person who actually uh, discovered it, um, not Newton for once, like a hundred years after Newton, I think, in fact, um, sometime after Newton anyway. Uh, so, uh, so Green's theorem is that the integral around a boundary of f dot dr, I'm missing a d here, is equal to the double integral of the curl of the vector field over the interior. And then if you want to write things in, in terms of coordinates, you can write out your line integral using this, this style of notation. And of course, curl of the vector field is just partial n partial x minus partial m partial y. So now that we know this is true, we can actually um, uh, compute some examples and see to what use we can put this kind of amazing fact.